It is, uh, it's good to be here tonight, guys. We're starting off a, a series. Um, I, I know that I'm, it's been kind of a little ambiguous. I want to say it's eight weeks, but it may go as many as ten weeks, but we're going to definitely go eight weeks. Um, and those who stick around, we may do a couple extra weeks to kind of solidify a few things. Um, because what I'm going to be talking about over the next um, two months, really, um, is going to take some work. So I'm going to ask you, this isn't just another you sit and you listen and, and you go about and you come back and sit and listen. I'm really going to ask you, and I'm telling you ahead of time, to, to you're going to have to do homework, you're going to have to work at, at doing this. I had to learn apologetics, and I had to set myself to learn it. And you're not going to learn all of it. I'm not, tonight I'm going to talk about how broad the, the, the subject is. But the things that we're going to cover, you want to commit yourself to learning as much as you can. So I'm saying all that to say tonight's going to be just really an introduction because um, I want to really challenge you on committing to it. And if you can't commit to it, I mean, you can show up. I mean, we're not going to tell you not to. But I'm just asking you as one of the leaders here and along with the pastor to, to commit to do the work because it's, it's more than just – this is what's wrong with the church. We come week after week and we listen to messages and then we don't – not us, not our church, of course, the church. We don't apply those things. But we have a generation who needs – salvation and so it takes work just like we're called disciples and guess what that comes from discipline right so we're supposed to be disciplined so as i'm going to ask you to do starting next week so since you didn't know about it i want you to bring flash cards and i want you to bring pens we're going to do we're going to use we're going to be doing things called syllogisms i don't know if you've ever heard of a syllogism but basically it's just a, it's usually a three premise it's, it's a logical argument that uses two premises to lead to a conclusion and so it, it's kind of a helpful way to learn some of the apologetics so that you can take them home and you can start learning them from your flashcards and so please bring those next week and if you if you forget to bring them we'll have them i mean we have them in here but i think if you get a buy in and you remember to bring them yourself then that's also extra good okay is that all right Turn to your neighbor and say, bring one. Bring more than one. <laughs> bring some flashcards, all right? No, you can do it. Just as long as something that you can write on that you can then start using to memorize. Just like if you haven't been a person who memorized Scripture, kind of in the same way you'd memorize Scripture, you're going to take these and through the week work on them. And it would be great if we could come back the next week and, and see if any of us learn some of them, Okay. So tonight I'm going to start out by just covering what apologetics is. A lot of people don't know. So why apologetics? I'm glad you asked. So in, in order to get started, let's look at what the word or what apologetics is and why it's a valuable tool. And I just want to say that up front and foot stomp. But it is a, it is a tool for all believers to help in the evangelistic effort of winning people to Christ. It's just a tool. The word apologetics comes from a Greek word, apologia, and it literally means defense, a reasoned argument. It originally referred to a formal defense of one's actions or belief, uh, particularly in a legal or courtroom setting. Apologia is derived from two words, apol apo and logia, which literally means to reason from. And so that's what we're doing is we're reasoning from now, here's the thing. In our culture, oftentimes, people like to say things like, I don't like arguing. Well, you have to learn to be a person who can argue. But what, I think what you mean when you, people say, I don't like arguing, is I don't like, I don't like fighting. Well, we don't want to fight ever. But, but we want to bring forth arguments because there's a world who has a belief system and, that's contrary to what we believe as, as, as followers of Jesus. And so an argument is just giving a reasoned response and idea to someone to help them to have a better understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, what salvation is, okay? And so in the context of Christian apologetics, this refers to defending the faith by providing reasoned arguments or explanations or of Christian beliefs. The term is famous, famous I can't use that word, famously, um, used in the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. This is a verse, would be a good verse if you ever wanted to memorize a verse for apologetics, and I'm going to read it to you. It says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always, everybody say always. always. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, when he gets to this place where he says, give an answer the word in Greek is given apologia, to give a reasoned answer. But I love this last part, and it says, but do this 
with gentleness and respect. See, you, you are called to bring the argument that there's a God in gentleness and respect, not fighting. Gently bringing the, the convincing arguments and attestations that God is reasonable, that faith is, is reasonable, that Jesus is real. And he tells us, uh, uh, Peter is telling the church that we have to be prepared. So that's why I'm asking you ahead of time to, to work at being prepared. When we talk about apologetics, we're talking about defending belief in God, defending the Christian faith. Now, I want to say this up front. If you thought you were coming to a Bible study, this is not a Bible study. We're, 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 we're going to talk about the Bible once in a while, but this is, by and large, a study of God outside of the Bible. Because that's what we live in a world who people don't even know if they believe the Bible. And so we, this is what we're covering in apologetics is what's called pre-evangelism. You're preparing people for the gospel message, okay? When we talk about apologetics, we're defending our faith. And so to begin tonight, we need to discuss the truth that God reveals himself in two primary ways. Now, some of you went to the last class that I taught uh, on, um, on conversational evangelism. This is uh, going to go part and parcel with that. If you were here, some of the stuff you'll hear tonight will be a, a repeat, but it's never good to, uh, it's never bad to hear stuff again, right? And to be reminded. And co- so, so God reveals himself in two primary ways, general revelation and special revelation. These are the two ways that God reveals himself to people, all people in the, in the earth. Special revelation occurs when God reveals himself through supernatural means, This happens when God makes a a specific effort to convey truth to us through personal and direct revelation. You know, examples of this would be the Word of God, right? When we read the Word of God, He he supernaturally, right? This is this is a this a special revelation He gives me. He He speaks to me through the Word, right? But a lot of people aren't reading the Bible when they're not Christians, right? But if they come to the Bible, God can through general, I mean, special revelation, reveal himself through the word. He does it through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Even before I was a Christian, he began to work on me. I know the Holy Spirit was drawing me. We can't come to God unless he does that. He speaks inner, to our inner witness. That's a way that he does that. Um, he, he, he does that sometimes through supernatural giftings. Someone might come with a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge. Sometimes God uses dreams and visions, etc. So when I came to Christ, the message of the gospel was conveyed to me through this type of revelation. And, and if you're a Christian here, which we all should be, a sermon, reading the Bible, a personal witness of another believer, God used special revelation to convey the truth of the fact that we were made for this relationship with God. We, we understood that because he specifically revealed it to us through his word. That sin disrupted our relationship and brought death. That God sent Jesus to die. The gospel message is an example of special revelation. God gave us the Bible to reveal what we can't know without that message. There's no way to know that Jesus died on a cross for us in the 21st century and that salvation comes by faith and grace Unless we had the Bible. That's why we have it. That's why it's so important, right? But we're not talking about this tonight. We're not talking about special revelations. We're going to go to another step. But I wanted you to understand that up front. While the methods and testimonies differ of every person in this room, it is with special revelation that ultimately stirred your faith to receive Jesus. And when you came to Christ, it was his special revelation that brought you there. And that's the goal of of apologetics is to get them there. But there's sometimes steps in order to even get them to the place where they're open to hearing special revelation or opening the Bible or coming to a church or listening to a podcast or a sermon. And so we're 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 steps before that. Does that make sense? So the Apostle Paul talked um, about also uh, what's called general revelation. So let's talk about that for a minute. General revelation is this is the simple I say it's simple because it's everywhere, but broad way that God reveals himself in everyday life. It's how we see the activity and the evidence of God all around us. It's the fingerprints he's left on everything that he's touched. It, it's, the, it's, it's the breadcrumbs of his creative actions and involvement in the world. The Apostle Paul talks about this kind of general revelation in his letter to the Romans. Um, his argument is that we don't have an excuse for not believing in God. 
Because even through general revelation, he's revealed. Even before people get special revelation. And remember that because we're going to come back to that later. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says this. Paul is writing and says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. He says, so that they are without excuse. He's clear everywhere we see general general revelation. And so what we're going to be talking about over the next month, two months, is how to use general revelation to get people to take a step toward God, to step toward Jesus. Apologetics emphasizes the evidence found in general revelation. So we can effectively point people to the truth that there is a God, that Jesus is God, that ultimately encourage them to investigate the claims of the Bible so they might be saved. The purpose of studying arguments for the evidence of God is solely to lead others toward exploring the word of God and the message of the gospel that is found in special revelation. So we are the step before. Okay, does this make sense? Turn to your neighbor and let's say, I'm getting it. All right, we just kind of keep you going, okay? Now, listen, if you get questions, this isn't just going to be a monologue. We have a microphone up here, and in a few minutes, when I open up for questions, if you raise your hand, we got to use the mics because we want to record your voice as well. Don't be scared, but uh, we'll get all of those questions in as well, okay? So I want to make an important, another foot stomp. I have a lot of foot stomps I'm going to make throughout this, right? But here's another foot stomp. People cannot be saved from their state of separation from God and sin through general revelation. In other words, just believing that there's something doesn't get them to the gospel. It gets them to the step before the gospel, so they're interested. We need the special revelation that's required. But general revelation shows us God's existence but it's special revelation that demonstrates our sinfulness, our need for salvation. In other words, we need to know how to share the message of of salvation as well. That's another class. But this is the step before, okay? So apologetics is the pre-evangelism foundation by which someone might search out for truth of who Jesus is. And there are a lot of people who come to Christ by starting in this very place. Because especially today, and I want to stop for just a moment. Most of us who are, most of us are older here in, tonight. Um, and if you were, I'm not saying anything bad about anybody, we're just a little older, right? If you were raised up in America, odds are uh, somebody in your family was Christian. It was a grandma, it was a cousin, it was an auntie, it was mom, it was dad. And you had a, generally speaking, or you knew somebody who had a Christian foundation who at least talked to you about it. We are living today, especially since 1984, and that's in the last class, we'll have to talk about that. But around 1984, we're living in a post-Christian, post-modern world. More and more, people don't know anything. Lots of people are calling themselves none when it talks about their religion. What's your religion? None. Not N-U-N, N-O-N-E. None. We don't have any. We don't have any idea of who God is. Not even sure there is a God. A different day. Back in my day, you could have came to me. I had a general belief in God, and I had a general belief in Jesus. I didn't doubt that he was a, at least a historical figure. You could have told me there was Jesus loved you, and he died on the cross for you. And I said, oh, yeah, I heard that story. And I, I at least got to that part, but I didn't understand the message of my sinfulness and how I needed him. And, but at least I was there. Now we're at a cu- place in our culture, and worldwide, by the way, where they're not even there. You say, the Bible says, they say, well, what's the Bible? I don't even believe the Bible. The Bible was just written by men. You say, well, God says, well, I don't believe in God. Well, so you can't even get to the, to the next step because you can't get beyond the very elementary things. And so apologetics builds a case for those things so you can help them answer the tough questions. OK, does that make sense? So let's talk for a few minutes about the pros. And I'm not going to say cons. I'm going to say the pros and the pitfalls to studying apologetics and using them because there are pros, but there are pitfalls. And we've got to learn to navigate them so that we don't fall into the pitfalls. Okay, I'm going to go to the pros first. We'll start there. Apologetics, number one, can shore up my own faith. So if you're here, even if you, now I'm not going to give you an out, okay, we're supposed to share our faith. But even if you didn't say share your faith, 
this would benefit you to learn what we're going to talk about because you're going to have doubts just like me. We all have doubts. I don't care. I've been saved for 35 years now. And once in a while, the devil comes after me, and I have to lean back on the things that, that I know and not what I don't know, right? And so this will shore up your faith. It shores up the faith. We live in a culture right now that's full of people who don't believe in God. Television shows, podcasts, social media, full of atheists, agnostics who take personal shots at Christians, and they say outrageous things claims they'll say things like well you have to choose god or science like like you have like that's a real choice that's not a real choice by the way but but that's what they'll tell our young people and they'll say well what do you mean if i take god i'm i'm rejecting science they say yeah, absolutely because that's fairy tale stuff and next thing you know their mind's confused and they have to have answers for that and so this will help you personally so apologetics can shore up your own faith okay so it's worth coming to all 10 weeks because you'll grow Number two, apologetics helps us to love the Lord with all our mind. Do you know the Bible says love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul? But everyone seems to avoid the mind part. We talk about, oh, yeah, I love him with all my heart. <laughs> I love him with all my soul. You're like, what about all your mind? Are you putting your mind into studying to show yourself approved? It's an essential part of our faith to engage our intellect. It's not It's part of who we are, folks. We don't have Easter Bunny faith. You'll hear me say that a lot. I say that all the time at work. I tell people, this isn't Easter Bunny faith. This is substantive faith that's based on truth. We don't just believe because, well, I just have to believe. No, that's only going to last for a little while until the devil comes rocking at your door, and you're going to have to give answers to why you believe what you believe. Are you understanding me? Apologetics will equip us intellectually. We must remember that is ultimately, though, and I wanted to say this is important, too, the Holy Spirit who strengthens and sustains our faith. But we put the knowledge in, we do the work, and the Holy Spirit shores us up, right? It is his work, but we've got to do our part. It's not just we sit back and, you know, that's why we have a lot of people who are, are still on milk when we should be on meat, right? Uh, C, ap apologetics equips us for evangelism, and that's the obvious, right? So a lot of people are afraid to share their faith because they don't feel like they can answer the hard questions. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be able to answer all the hard questions, but you'll be able to answer some of the hard questions if you stick with us, okay? None of us have the answers to all the hard questions. And some of the questions don't even have answers this side of heaven, except that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, and that's okay to say that, okay? Some answers we just don't know. Some things about God we don't know. I know that there's a trinity, but I can't understand it fully, right? I know that God is, Jesus is fully God and fully man, but that doesn't make sense to me mentally and intellectually, but I know it's true, right? So we do come across things that we have to have confidence in, but it'll equip us. The goal of apologetics, and I want you to remember this, this is also one that you're just going to, I want you to hold on to this entire time. The goal of apologetics is to move people just one step closer to Jesus. That's it. Say, say one step. That's it. Sometimes we feel like, oh, I really failed. I got a sister and I haven't brought her all the way. Or, or you began to share your faith with somebody. I didn't get them to the plan of salvation. I didn't get them to pray the prayer. I didn't get them. Did you get them one step closer? That's a step. Because lesson, the Bible, the Apostle Paul said, uh, it says one man plants, another man waters, but God gives the increase. You might just be the person that's planting. Or you might just be the person that watered a little bit for that person at work, that person in your family. You put a, uh, there's a guy named Greg Coco. I love him. His book called Tactics. If you don't have it, I recommend you buy it. It's a great book. He says, um, you're just putting a stone in their shoe. And that's what you're doing. If you could put a stone in their shoe to get them feeling kind of uncomfortable. In other words, they're going about their day. No one's challenging them about God. No one is. And all of a sudden, you said something that gets them thinking. They're like, well, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable about that, you know? And all of a sudden, they're thinking about God. They haven't been thinking about him. And the next thing you know, hey, one step closer, okay? Say it again, one step. It's a win if you get them one step. Listen, I get on planes. I share my faith. Every time I, you don't want to sit down this, if you're not a Christian next to me on the plane, right? I will, I will be talking. I'll be looking for opportunities. But I love if I get them all the way to plan of salvation, but today it's, it's less and less likely because we live in, they have so much to work through. But if I can just move them to answer a couple questions. Matter of fact, sometimes we try to pull out that shotgun and blast them with too much, and we end up doing, and we'll come back to that. We do more harm than we do good. So one step closer. Next, apologetics supports the mission of the church. I want you to hear this, okay? 
It's not only for you. It's not only for the people out there. It's for the other brother and sister. Jesus said, make, go and make disciples. We're discipling one another. And so there are people in our body, in our fellowship, who, who are new in the faith, who, are getting, who get saved on Sunday. Next thing you know, they're hanging out in your small group. Next thing you know, they're talking to you, and they start having doubts. And they don't have to wait till they can get a, a, an interview with the pastor that week because you have answers. Because you're going to be able to build up the body. Understand? So the body will benefit by you learning some apologetic arguments or your spouse or your child who's going to school and coming home. And he says, the, the science teacher told me dot, dot, dot. I don't have any answers. Dad, is this true? You say, of course, it's not true. Let me tell you some things that I can help counter that or a grandchild or a sister or are you getting it? And so apologetics supports the church mission. It shores up our faith and other people's faith. So you can see the benefit of you learning this, okay? Now let's get to the pitfalls. We're not going to go really long every week. We're probably going to be done between 8 and 8.15 every week, just so you know, okay? The pitfalls to be aware of, the first one is pride and intellectual arrogance. Pride in knowledge. See, when we get really good at apologetic arguments, there's a danger of letting pride creep in. It can be easy to focus on feeling intellectually superior rather than staying humble. Remember that first verse I read to you? Do so with gentleness and respect, okay? When we're focusing on witnessing, we need to come across as a servant. Jesus said, this is how my disciples act. He took a basin and he washed the disciples' feet, and he said, uh, no, great, no, 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 no servant is greater than his master. As you've seen me do, you do. Now, we're not out washing each other's feet, but what he meant by that, in one aspect, although I do believe in foot washing as a sacrament, but he meant by that serving like this. And when we bring apologetics to somebody, we have to remember to serve them. The love of the argument has to trump everything. See, I'm arguing with this person because I love them, and it needs to not feel like an attack. It needs to feel like an argument in love where I'm giving them a different opinion than maybe they've heard. Are you with me? Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm with you. <laughs> All right. Some of you ain't got neighbors, but that's okay. You can look at me and say it. One of the other pitfalls of pride and intellectual arrogance is sometimes we can have a dismissive attitude. There's, there's the risk of becoming dismissive. If they don't want to believe it? No, 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 no. Jesus, man, he, he, he said 70 times 7. You got to go back. <laughs> you got to love on them. You got to be persistent. You don't dismiss people. Oh, they didn't believe it. I gave it. I'm a now, there are times when eventually somebody doesn't listen. You shake the dust off your feet. We know that does happen. And you don't cast pearls among swines because people aren't listening. And that's going to happen sometimes. But you don't just dismiss people because you had a good argument and they didn't hear it. Because that's, that's arrogance. That's pride, Right? There's a risk of becoming dismissive and condescending toward people who don't accept or understand the arguments, which can end up doing more harm than good when it comes to the gospel. Oh, yeah, I heard that argument before, and I don't need no Christian. You don't want to be the guy that's keeping people from heaven or the gal because you are so harsh. So we want to use these arguments, but we have to look for opportunities. We have to pray for wisdom. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. We have to do so with gentleness and respect. Argumentation for argumentation's sake is the next point. So losing the goal of evangelism. Sometimes we like the argument. Some people like to argue. You know what I'm talking about, right? You might be that person. I was that person. I'd, 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 I'd hold the opposing argument even if I didn't believe it, just so I could have a good argument with you. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You laugh because you guys know somebody like that, or you are that. Now, God, God delivered me from that, right? But it can well up in me. So losing the goal of evangelism, always remember, this is, I love this quote by Ravi Zacharias. Always remember there's a person behind every conversation. He said this, answer the questioner, not the question. Yeah, don't answer the, don't answer the question. Remember, there's a questioner. You're answering the questioner. You're, you're trying to say, wonder why they're thinking that. And let me answer it in a way that meets them so that they can leave with it, not so I just tell them, well, you believe that? That's a stupid thing, you know? Because a lot of people believe a lot of stupid things. I'm just going to tell you. 
You're going to find when you start sharing your faith, people will have some, some ideas. You're like, what? Where did you get that? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to cover that, but this is a fr- I'm going to give you a free, a free um, bonbon tonight. A free bon- fry bonbon. That's German for free candy. Okay, I'm going to give you a free candy. Ready? Here it is. That book, Tactics. I'm gonna, I'll probably come over this a few times, but I want to tell you there's three questions in that book, Tactics, that you, I want. I'll probably bring this up every week, maybe. There's three questions I want you to memorize. I want you to start memorizing them tonight. If you can memorize these three questions tonight and you incorporate them every time you have a conversation that's apologetics, or you will be ahead, okay? Here they are. And you're like, wow, this is something right here. These, three, these are three questions. It's changed my whole life in the way that I talk to people. Here's the first question What do you mean by that? That's what you say. When someone says something completely outrageous, well, I believe that the Bible was just written by men. Really? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it was a bunch of men wrote the Bible, you know, and they, uh, you know, they, who knows? They were probably, you know, in the, in the, in the in, you know, six, six centuries afterwards. Who knows? You know, it was probably a long time even after Jesus, you know. Now, in your mind, you're thinking this person has no clue because they don't know the history of, of the Bible. They don't know the history. of. But they heard that somewhere, that it was written by people. Just a bunch of men wrote the Bible, whatever. So you say, what do you mean by that? And then they have an opportunity to say, well, I, and they say something. Second, second question. How did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, how did you come to that conclusion? Not like, how did you come to that conclusion, you bonehead? Not that. You say it like this. Wow, how did you come to that conclusion? And what you're doing is you'll find out most of them, they heard, um, I call it meme theology. They read a meme online or they saw some little TikTok or somebody said it at work and they have no ability to defend why they even believe it. They say, well, uh, because it's, it's true, you know. It's the telephone game, you know. The, uh, one person told it to the other person and the other person, by the time it got to us, who knows if the Bible's even corrupted. It just came through all those people. People say that all the time. That's the most ridiculous thing that a person who knows apologetics, but I'm not going to tell them how ridiculous. I would say, wow, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I, you know, I heard it somewhere. And then the third one it, question you say is, well, have you considered this? And then you give them a simple apologetic argument that would help defeat that or at least put a stone in their shoe. You might not tear it all down, but you're giving them something else to hear that they haven't maybe thought about. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you considered this? Are you, isn't that simple? But you'll forget it, but you're going to go over it enough times you'll have it down, okay? Memorize those right now. That would be really helpful. Matter of fact, I might bring some kind of prize next week for somebody if they can get those three up front. Can't be you, though, because you've already been in the class twice. <laughs> okay. Always remember that there's a questioner behind the question. It's easy to get caught up in the back and forth of the argument, right? It's possible to win the battle but lose the war. See, it doesn't mean if you, if you defeat them and show them that you that Christianity is intellectually superior to whatever they have, big deal. You just lost the war for that person. You didn't meet them where they were. Are you with me? David Geisler, in the book Conversational Evangelism, he talks about the three Ds, and I like these. He says, when we're, when we're sharing our faith, we should surface doubts. We want them to surface doubts. We need to um, keep them from becoming defensive. And listen, if they get defensive, you're done. You may never get another chance with them, or it may be a long time. And family members are the worst, man. If you get a family member defensive, they're going to just avoid you at the, at the next family reunion, right? They're going to be like, oh, no, I'm not talking about that with you. Um, so you want to surface the doubts by, by uncovering them as you ask those questions. In it, right? What do you mean by that? How would you come to that conclusion? You're surfacing doubts. Keep them from being defensive and then leave them with a desire for more. Right? You want, here, this is so important too. This is another foot stomp. I like all these foot stomps, right? Here's a foot stomp. You should, even if you learn every single thing that we talk about over these 10 weeks and you're the most amazing person at, at what's called the classical approach to apologetics, which is what we're covering, if you give all, all of those 12 points to somebody, they will never come back to your house. If you blast them off of the porch when the Mormon comes by and knocks on the door with all 12 points, they're not coming back. What we need to do is be people who use what's called apologetics light. 
like, you know, like when you do uh, Diet Cola, <laughs> apologetics light, L-I-T-E. You, you may learn a lot of arguments, but, but when you're talking to somebody, maybe give them one to think about. You give them one, you give them another one, you give them another one, you look like you're just trying to bash them, and they'll come across like you're arrogant. And they'll start, they'll start trying to, they'll even make up stuff to try to argue with you, right? You, you, so you, you want to use all these tools very sparingly. Because the goal isn't for you to win battles. The goal is for you to get them interested in learning about Jesus and maybe considering him. So you give them a couple arguments about things they covered. Well, let's just talk about evolution. Let's just talk about this. Let's talk about the historicity of the Bible. You, start, you can come up with all kinds of things. Next thing you know, like they've checked out. Da, 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 they've gone, right? So we should always have an apologetics light approach to apologetics. Too much overwhelming makes us look arrogant and limits the argument uh, for God. I mean, the limit, limiting the arguments for God is very important. So we just want to give them a little. Just give them a little, a little taste. Because remember, remember I said at the end of that, you want them to come back for more. You want them to desire, hey, remember that conversation we had last week? I was thinking about that. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> and then you can give them another little nugget. You understand? But if you give them everything at once, they're done. I promise you. I was, there's some people, though, I'm not saying God can't save people like that, but it takes them a lot further. There's God perfect will and his permissive will, right? Some people are on that permissive will, taking a long road, because some of us got, some of us, you know, some people don't, don't come to Jesus because of the church, right? Because the church are so mean. People are so arrogant. People are so hypocritical. So they got all these reasons. We don't want to be those people, okay? Are you guys with me? Everybody listening? All right. Next one is over-reliance. This is another pitfall. Over-reliance on intellectualism. Sometimes deep diving into apologetics can make make the person be, become, it becomes more complicated than they need. In other words, the gospel is, message is simple. Um, I remember when I was a young Christian, this is a sidebar, but it kind of relates. I led these guys to Christ in my dorm. I had come to Christ in my dormitory, and my goal was to win the whole dorm. I ended up through the grace of God by leading like 13 guys to Christ in our floor. It was awesome. Me and another guy, we were just going for it. But these one, two guys, man, they came to Jesus and they were excited. They, they were crying. They got born again. And the next day I was in the room. I was like, what, what's this music I'm listening to? Why are you listening to this heavy metal music? This isn't what you're supposed to do. And I was like telling them, da, da, da. what I was doing is I had a desire to bring them along, but I was trying to shoot them with all of the things that I had learned in one blast. And I blasted them right back and I said, man, this Christianity sounds like it's full of all these rules and stuff. It's kind of the same that, that if we give them too much, if we hammer them or too, do it too much, some people don't even need apologetics. Some people just want to hear about your love for Jesus. And you have to know when you give it and when you don't based on how they talk to you. Does that make sense? Because some people, some people, are, they're not intellectual. They're not heady. They're very emotional. And you're, that's a different, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But you, you meet people where they are. The real intellectual ones, you use more apologetics. The ones not so intellectual, just give them a little and then talk about the love of God, the, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the fatherhood of God, whatever it is, you know, to get them there. Some people don't need apologetics at all. I'll just say that. And here's what, here's what there's three barriers <clears throat> that keep people from becoming Christians. The first one is head, the head barrier. So the head barrier is, um, is when they have actual intellectual doubts. Maybe they're doubting how, how is how is it that the, the universe is 13 billion years old, according to my science teacher in my university, and you're telling me God created the earth in six days? How do you reconcile that? I'm pro I have problems with that. I have problems with evolution when my biology teacher tells me that, and the Bible says that God created humans, right? Uh, it, you know, it, 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 it says according to the way they understood it that he made them in six days, and he made them on one day. He, he created them fully. Or, or they have questions about, um, I don't understand how Jesus, maybe he wasn't even a real person. There's a lot of evidence. They're watching the History Channel and see these horrible 
documentaries that give all this craziness about the Gospel of Thomas and Enoch and all these books that aren't even in the Bible. And they come up, they saw this, and now they're all confused by that. Or they're not even sure that, that they don't even know anything about the Bible, but they, they think they do. And they think, it, you know, they think that it was just used to, to put people in slavery, and it was used to, to oppress women, and it was used to, and they have all these ideas. And they, in other words, they have all these ideas that they genuinely, uh, it's keeping them from faith. Someone showed him a meme online that, that God said, bash babies' heads against rocks in the book of Psalms. And they said, what kind of God would do that? They didn't know that it was out of context, and it was David talking about it through his anger and his frustration. It wasn't God saying that. So what I'm saying is, they really are having issues. And so those people, they need apologetics. Those are the head issues. They, they need answers. Okay. Then you have people who have heart barriers. This is somebody who, who's been hurt or has an emotional wound. Maybe they were molested. Maybe, maybe someone in the church hurt them. Maybe they, maybe they had a bad father figure and they have a hard time trusting men, especially somebody who we call a heavenly father. In, in these cases, apologetics isn't the problem. It's a heart issue, and we need to come to them with heart answers. Maybe the spouse died of cancer, and I say to him, well, let me just tell you why the Bible is legitimate. And the 66 books are real. Well, I don't care. Your God killed my wife with cancer. What I'm saying is there's real barriers, and we minister to those people differently. We don't come with apologetics. We come with the gospel message of love. Now, we always do it with love, but we just bring that. Does that make sense? And then there's the other one. The last type is the volitional barrier. Volition just means will. Some people, no matter what, they do not want to serve God. I used to think if I could give them a good enough argument, <laughs> they're going to come to Jesus. I mean, it, it's clearly I'm just giving you an, um, the most amazing argument. I actually remember talking to a guy in Knoxville, Tennessee. I was in a parking lot and I gave him every argument. I did the opposite of what I just told you guys to do. I gave him argument after argument. I was just, I was showing him and he said, you know what? It might be true, but I'm just not ready to give up my life. That's the volitional argument, a barrier. It's a real barrier. You know, it's this. I believe what I want to believe so I can do what I want to do. That's it. And those people, you will not convince them with all the apologetics in the world. You pray for them, but you don't waste a lot of time with them. you got to be able to say, Lord, I just give them over. And if they come and they genuine, And you know the ones, some just want to argue. They don't really want answers. And you give them a good answer, they give you the next argument. You give them a good answer, they give you, you're like, okay. Are you really? So I love, I love the way that Frank Turek does it. He says this. If I could, he says, if I could convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Lord, would you become a Christian? And he said, you'd be surprised how many will say no. So we think that, because the Bible says broad is the road that leads to hell, and only few find it. People don't want, people want to live without God. So that's why a lot of people follow these lies. So we just have to recognize we're using apologetics for the head barriers, okay? The ones who have those questions. Lastly, we don't want to overcomplicate things. Creating confusion, sometimes diving too deep into apologetics, and some people do this, can make more comp Sometimes it can create... <laughs> in my first class, I'm in apologetics doctoral program right now, and it was on contemporary atheism. I had to read 14 books by atheists, and I was dying as I read those books, man. I thought, my gosh, if I handed these to a lot of my new Christian friends, they'd just fall away. Because one of them was a pastor who was a pastor for 15 years. Now he's an atheist and wrote a book. And I had to read that, and I thought, this is the worst thing. But it was good because it ended up shoring up my faith. But not everybody's ready for that. So if you just dive into this stuff headlong, and you just do it all the time, and I see guys who love it so much, it's almost that they love apologetics more than they love God. That's a problem. It's just a tool, okay? And it's an intellectual bearer for some people. For some people, to connect with their faith more through personal experiences. This is what they want. Apologetics might feel too much like like it's just overwhelming and they just want to hear your testimony <laughs> a lot of, i hate to say it, but the truth is and the statistics are done this women are more open to the heart barriers issues than they're the head barriers not to say that there aren't women who have the head barriers but generally uh, that that is a true s study and i i learned that in one of my classes that y usually you start arguing stuff with them they just want to give them your story because i'm going to talk about this in a minute your testimony is also an apologetic by the way all right, so let's go into the different types of apologetics, and we're going to try to land the plane in about 15 minutes, okay? One thing to note right up front is that apologetics is very broad. 
This class will only cover a small portion of the full discipline of apologetics. I'm going to touch on a few different types of apologetics, and I want to tell you these because I want to encourage you to, to learn them. Study them later on. You know, get some books. There's so many books out there on all these different types of arguments. There's different approaches to how you would give the arguments of apologetics. The first is called evidential apologetics. So evidential apologetics focuses on using concrete evidence, things that we can observe, measure, and prove to show that Christianity is true. Apologists using this method point to evidence like the reliability of the Bible, the historical records of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. They may talk about the Old Testament and how that he fulfilled over 300 prophecies to the letter. They might cover those. The goal is to show that belief in Christianity isn't just a leap of faith, but it's supported by real world facts. So an, an example of, a, of an evidential apologist, he might discuss archaeological finds like the the Shroud of Turin, which has come back. I don't know if you guys noticed in the news lately, but the Shroud of Turin, have you heard of the Shroud of Turin? Do you know, does anyone not know what the Shroud of Turin is? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, the Shroud of Turin is a cloth that they believe, it's believed that it covered Jesus, that the Catholic Church has had, and that came out around the 1300s. Now, there's been a lot of people who said that they, it's definitely not, but it's really interesting. We have enough time to go into it. You can look in it. But it, it looks like a um, negative of a photo. And when somebody took a picture of it, the negative looks just like Jesus. It's pretty crazy. And there, so anyway, in the 1980s, they did all this research on it. They tried to carbon date it. They tested the blood on it. They did all this stuff. And they came back and they said, no, it's definitely dated to the 1300s. And it was, it was put on the, on the back shelf after that. By Now, the Catholics who held it still believe 100% percent it's it but scientific community said the shroud of turin couldn't be because we carbon dated it well now they've taken a new look at it a guy named gary habermas who's an apologist got a team and they've taken another look and they found out what they carbon dated was a repair around the outside of it because they had had a fire in that building and they repaired it and they repaired it in the 1300s but now when they carbon date it, it goes back to the first century but it's pretty amazing. It's got blood on it. It's pretty cool. So anyway, I said all that to say people who would want to share, like I'm telling you right now, see, I would tell that story as an evidential apologetic argument. And I would bring that up to people to tell them to say, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's look into that. Now, let's say this. Even if the Shroud of Turin is real and we find out it is first century, which we believe it is now, and that it is a man, definitely, and it looks like he was crucified because he has wounds on his head, wounds on his hands, a wound on his side. It looks to be Jesus. They can still say, I, I, that's not proof, but it is, it is evidence of a possibility, right? In other words, you can't prove that Jesus lived. You can give proofs. It's a proof. But they have to put their faith in it, right? I promise you, if you, took a, if you had a video of Jesus, someone somehow came out, they'd say that it was forged. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. Some people, no matter what you gave them, they would say it's something. But for people who are open to those types of things, this is apologetic. This is an evidential apologetic argument. The Shroud of Turin is pretty interesting, isn't it? You guys got excited about it. They just heard about it, right? So... Josh McDowell, if you want to know some of the proponents, Josh McDowell has a book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. His son, Sean McDowell, has come out with him. There's another book called More Than a Carpenter. It's a great little simple read, but it's evidential apologetics. It's a form of apologetics that looks at evidences for people who just want to do that. Um, there's another book by uh, J. Warner Wallace. It's called Cold Case Christianity. He was, a, he was a homicide detective in California, and he uses the tools of detective to analyze the evidence of Christianity. It's pretty interesting. Uh, there's a guy named Lee Strobel. You might have heard of The Case for Christ. I think they made it into a movie, The Case for Christ, Case for Faith. They have another book called The Case for Easter, um, The Case for the Resurrection. He was an investigative journalist who was in New York City, and he set out to disprove that Jesus was real. Wrote an article, became a believer, and now wrote this book. So it's pretty neat. Josh McDowell was also a lawyer trying to prove that Jesus was wasn't real and became a believer and then wrote that. So it's interesting, right? So that is evidential apologetics. The next one is called presuppositional apologetics. Now, this one's a little harder to get our heads around. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But presuppositional apologetics starts with the belief that the Bible is true and that Christians 
beliefs give us the right foundation to understand everything in the world. It's kind of like everyone has presuppositions. Like everyone looks at the world through different glasses. So Christians, we look at the world through Christian glasses, and we see the evidence through our Christian glasses. Someone who says there is no God looks at through glasses that says there is no God, right? But presuppositional apologetics says you cannot look through your glasses and see the things that we see. You can only see them through the through the eyes of Christianity. And I'm going to give you an example. Let me give you this example. Listen, here's a presuppositional argument. Someone says, if someone says, um, I don't believe in God because there's evil in the world. I mean, look, how, look at the evil things that happen. I mean, people are raping children. Hitler is massac massacring six million Jews. So I can't believe that there would be a God that would do that. So here's a presuppositional argument. You'd say, how do you know that it's evil? Genuinely want to know. How, how do you determine what's evil? So what standard are you measuring it by to say, I mean, if there is no God, it's just an opinion. Your opinion over my opinion, you know. Uh, if my opinion says, hey, we, we, we should kill old women, then that's my opinion, you know. And you can't say it's wrong or right because you can't appeal to anything higher than yourself. So we would say you're robbing from God. You're actually borrowing from Christianity to call something evil. See, we look at it through presuppositional eyes. When a scientist says, well, science is the answer, we would say, no, you can't even do science without the presuppositions of, of Christianity because, because you believe in what's called mathematics. And mathematics exists and they're discovering it, and it exists outside of our discoveries. We don't create mathematics. It's already there. Well, how could it be there? How can you have a principle called mathematics that hangs out there unless there's something behind a mind that created it? So you're borrowing from God to say that you can do math. You're borrowing from God to say that you can, um, that, that you can do uh, uh, science because there are laws uh, like uh, the, law of, uh, the laws of physics. The laws of physics do not change ever. So if there was no God, they would be changing all the time. If we were, if there's no God, we're just random particles that came together through random chance and we're randomly moving around. We're like, we're like molecules bumping into molecules. We're literally, if you think about it, we're no different than grasshoppers or, or a tree or sand because we're just the product of random occurrences through time plus chance plus matter. That's all. So if there is no God, then everything's random. And how do we have these laws, the laws of physics? How do we have the, the in logic, we have the laws of logic, the laws of non-contradiction. We'll talk about them next week. We have all these laws. We, we, within us, we have moral laws. We know we're not supposed to eat old, old women and kick babies across the house. We know that in every culture. How do we know that? Because you, if you say it's wrong, you're borrowing from our faith to say it's wrong. Do you understand? So presuppositional arguments argue from the standpoint that there is a God and, and you're borrowing from him to make your arguments. And so you're giving arguments back. Does that make sense? That's also a really cool thing. If you want to if you want to study some people, Cornelius Van Til has a book called The Defense of Faith. You, by the way, all these notes are going to be available at the end of this. You're going to get them all. OK. The Defense of Faith, Van Til is a founder of the presuppositional arguments. Another guy named Greg Bonson, he wrote a book called Always Ready. Um, those are good. So let's move on because we've got to close. Uh, experiential apologetics. I love this one. I'm probably going to write my doctoral thesis on this one because I think it's the least, uh, I, and I'm really good. It's going to be a fight, so you've got to pray for me because it's, it's the least um, accepted among a lot of scholars. But I think it's the most important in, in Scripture. Uh, experiential apologetics focuses on how personal experiences, both historical and modern, testify to the truth of the transformative power of the Christian faith. Rather than centering on abstract arguments or factual evidence, this approach emphasizes real-life experiences, personal testimony, the impact of faith on individuals. It demonstrates that Christianity is true not just because of intellectual reasons, because it works. It changes lives. And I love it because the Bible's full of it. Paul said, hey, I used to be a rascal. He told everybody. 
his testimony. He said, but I was on the road to Damascus, and I was knocked off a horse, and God changed me. I used to kill Christians. Now I'm, you know. So that's a testimony, and that brings as many people to Christ when we share testimony. It's an important part of it, by the way. If you haven't learned how to give your testimony in about five minutes, you should try to practice it so that when you talk to somebody, you can explain to them how to come to Christ in about five to seven minutes from what you did and how you realized you were a sinner and how you realized the need for God and sharing stories about miracles. I mean, that's all right. They walked around not just doing miracles, but testifying. The whole Old Testament is about that. Matter of fact, I just finished Deuteronomy in my in my personal study. And you know what? When Moses was was told he couldn't go into the promised land, he could have went up on the mountain, crossed his arms and pouted. He could have. He didn't know. He gathered all of Israel and he said, assemble yourselves. And he gave them the stories of the Red Sea crossing. He gave them the stories of the manna in the wilderness. He gave them the stories of the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. He gave them stories. Why did he give them stories? Because those stories built the faith of the young people going into the new territory, the new land. They were going to taking the stories with them. So there's power in experiential apologetics. Okay. So learn to tell stories. And they have learned. They have, it is interesting that Gen Z and Gen A, which are the people coming up right now, they are really open to stories. Narrative, narrative, narrative. You can give apologetics, but tell your story. When I'm doing door-to-door uh, witnessing in the hospital every day, I don't know how many times in a week I tell, I tell them my story of when I was in Spangdown, Germany. I was an alcoholic, and Jesus touched me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I prayed a prayer, and he changed my life, and I felt the love of a father. And I see people cry in front of me who said they didn't know if they believed in God, but all of a sudden they're crying just listening to my story. There's power in experiential apologetics, okay? Now, that one, I, I don't think we have to have a whole... 10-week class on that. You are the experience, but you got to learn how to share it, and you got to share your story, okay? Is that good? Apostle Paul did it. The woman at the well, remember her? She came to Christ, and she went back to her town and said, Let me, come meet a man who, who told me everything about my life, and they all came out. It was just a story. All right, let's move on. we got to close. I keep saying that. I know my wife's going to be looking at that clock, so let me go here. Um, so there's a lot here. Uh, some of the Big books on that. C.S. Lewis, his book, Mere Christianity, talks a lot about his own journey of atheism to faith. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, uh, he passed away a few years ago. He was known for blending stories all through his arguments. Um, And then there's one that I'm really going to barely touch on. It's called Reformed Epistemology. (laughs) You don't even have to remember this word, but you can kind of remember it. It's probably the least employed of all of them. It was developed by a guy named Alvin Plantiga. He's He's a super smart guy. Um, his argument is that God is just what he calls properly basic. He says everyone believes in God. He says if somebody tells you they don't believe in God, they're just lying. Now, that's not really good argument for somebody who really thinks they don't believe in God. But he thinks it's like this. It's like having a smoke detector with no batteries in it. That they just took the batteries out. But we all have this, this properly basic belief that there's a God. We just know it. It's just something we know. Like we know that there has to be a God because we see so many things like beauty and life and we get up and there's like, like here's the thing. The argument is if there's no God, there's no purpose, there's no meaning and there's no value. Think about that. If, if we're just random, there's no purpose in life. I mean, what's your purpose? How can you even say you have a purpose? Your purpose is what? Might as well go kill people. And matter of fact, you might as well go just uh, get yours, you know, take, rob a bank, do whatever you got to do. If there's no reason, why were we all not just living crazy and lawless? I mean, just do it, man. We should be the Wild West. But we know there's purpose. It's in us. We know there's meaning. Something about us, we know. We have some, we're supposed to do something big. We know that. We all have, we love epic stories because we want to be part of an epic story ourselves, don't we? We love to read. People love Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Gilgamesh epic. And they love those because it appeals to us from what he says, which is a properly basic idea that we know that we're special. We're called the Imagio Dei. We're made in the image of God. And we're just denying that. And so he tries to argue with people by basically saying, uh, you have an innate sense of God's existence and talking to them about that and getting them to kind of to, to deductively think about their life and how there has to be a God in order to have meaning, purpose, and value, which is a good argument. I'm just not saying if somebody comes up to me and says, oh, I don't believe in God, and I say, oh, of course you do, <laughs> that that's, the, that's never the best answer, you know. But if I can somehow through a conversation talk to them about meaning 
well, what do you think you're here for? And if they say that they, they, that they have a reason, you say, well, who do you think gave you that purpose? You know what I mean? You guys understand that this is true, right? We all know that, don't we? We know that we have purpose, meaning, and value. But we, ha- we had to discover it because we had a broken issue in our life called sin, right? All right, so that's, a, that's a reformed epistemology. Um, I'm not even going to give any books on that. There's, uh, there's probably a few, but I'm, we're going to move on. We're going to close it out, though. Okay, here it is. This is where we're going. So drum roll, please. For the next um, 10, eight, nine weeks, we're going to be looking at classical apologetics. So classical apologetics is basically a two-step approach that uses logic and reason. We're going to talk about some logical things. Some of them are going to be a little challenging. You're going to have to ask questions a few times, and that's okay. We're going to take some time with them because uh, we're going to have some, lo- some arguments from philosophy, too. So through logic and reasoning, we're going to argue for the existence of God, and then we're going to uh, present the historical uh, and evidential evidence to defend the specific claims of Christianity. So this method appeals to people who value rational, logical arguments, emphasizes how Christianity is both reasonable and it's also historical. So classic apologetics believes that before someone can accept, G- accept the, cl- the specific claims of Christianity, like the resurrection, they have to be convinced that God exists. So we have to build a case for God. With evidential um, the first one we talked about, they, they assume people believe in God. They're just giving evidence for how Jesus is God and how the Jesus, uh, you see what I'm saying? We're building a case for is there a God, and then we're going to build on that. Does that make sense? So it's called the classical approach because it builds layer upon layer, and you're going to do that. You're going to be able to do that, okay? So um, logical arguments for God, historical arguments for God, and also the combination of reason and evidence. So the last slide we'll put up here, this is the 12 steps we're going to look at. Uh, and we're going to cover these probably two next week. We're going to the third the next week after that, we're going to probably take an entire night because that's one of the hardest ones. Uh, so the first one will be truth about reality is knowable. That's next week. So here's the thing. You have to believe that there is truth in order to then get to the next step. Then we're going to talk about the opposite of true is false. But you're going to think you're thinking to yourself, isn't this just automatic? It's not, unfortunately, in our culture. We believe in what's called moral relativism in our culture. So people don't believe in true and false. They don't believe. They'll say, that's your truth, you know, or I believe. And then they tell you what they believe. Right. But we're going to get to the we're going to try to whittle that away and show you it's not just about what you believe. It's about is there truth and what is truth. Okay, so that'll be the first week. The next week is, is it true that the theistic God exists? That's the one that's going to be the hardest work. We may even take two weeks on that. We want to give arguments, sound, ironclad arguments that there is a God, that he does exist through philosophy and through science, okay? Then, um, number four, it's automatic. Once you get them to believe that God exists, the next point, if God exists, then miracles are possible. That's the argument. Because if there's a God, when someone says they don't believe in miracles, what they're really saying is they don't believe in God. Um, and so we'll talk about that. We'll probably cover that in a couple of them that night. Miracles then can be used to confirm the message from God. That's an argument. And then number six, the New Testament is historically reliable. We have to go there because now we're going to open the Bible. So we have to tell them the, that the New Testament is historically, historically, historically reliable in order to then open the Bible. Because if you just open the Bible and they just believe it's just like another book like Moby Dick, you ain't getting anywhere. But if you can build the case, then you can open it. And then once you build the case, you, the New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. We're going to argue that, right? And then if Jesus claimed to be God, it, it, was, it, was, it was confirmed through the miracles that he did. He didn't just claim it. He actually lived it. And then you're building a case, right? And then, and then therefore, Jesus is God. <laughs> and so then it goes on to whatever Jesus, who is God, teaches must be true because he's God, right? And then you say, well, wait a second. Therefore, it's true that the Bible is the word of God because Jesus said it was true. So you're building a case. And then you can open the Bible and tell them about salvation. Do you understand? So you're building a case. That's called the classical approach to apologetics. Now, it can, you can really get in the weeds on all this. There are so many good arguments out there. You, we, could, we, could do, we could do a year's worth of study and not scratch the surface on some of the good arguments. 
There is some great philosophy from the 12th century. I think it's the 12th century. Thomas Aquinas. He has some philosophical arguments that just turn your head. I mean, they're so good. But you have to sit and think about them. The average guy out there, if I gave you a good argument, and not, not you guys, of course, because you guys are above the, the fray. But the average person on the street, they would be looking at me like, what are you telling me right now? But if you can get through it, you're like, wow, this is a solid argument for God just based on philosophy. So there's some good arguments. So that's it. You were drinking from a fire hydrant tonight, right? That's kind of talk really fast. But okay, so here's the good news. Rhonda, if you'll go to the, there you go. There's your notes. If you'll point your phone at that thing, you can download these notes. And uh, if you haven't figured it out, I can't help you. Your person next to you can, though. We're going to close out in prayer and try to be out of here by 8.15, which was my promise. My promise was 8 to 8.15, so let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you, Jesus, that you have made yourself so evidently clear to us, Lord. God, you're everywhere, Lord, in beauty, in philosophy, in logic, in nature, in love, in family. God, in everything that we see and everything that we're part of. God, we don't even we can't even take our next breath without you, Lord. You hold all things together. We bless you and we praise you and we worship you and we thank you for the truth, Lord God. We thank you that you are not just the bearer of truth. You are truth itself, Lord. We bless you and thank you, Father, for gathering us tonight. I pray you'll be with us as we go home and uh, allow us to come back together on Sunday to worship together and bless the rest of this week in Jesus' precious name. Amen.